Well, this is a very humbling moment for me and and for our team. Um, and I'm going to give you some history of of the discovery today, a little bit uh, in more in depth. We last night, um, my colleague uh, Professor Joseph Garfinkel and I were here at Southern Adventist University. He is. We are on our way to our professional meetings next week in Boston for the American uh, uh, Schools of Overseas Research, ASOR, as it's known, which is the professional organization that brings archaeologists and historians and biblical scholars from all over the world. We're going to be in Boston next week presenting this formally to that a group of scholars. Um, the scientific report was published just about a week ago. Um, in our peer reviewed in a peer reviewed journal, um, and I can send you guys all the uh, links for this uh, after, or I'll send it to Phil maybe, and he can forward it all to you. Um, but this is Yossi Garfinkel and I last night at Lynn Woodhall Chapel on the campus of Southern Adventist University. Yossi and I have known each other um, about thirty years. This year, <laughs> we 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 were both doctoral students working together at a at a Philistine site thirty years ago. He was directing the field. I was his associate director, and I guess that kind of just has grown over the years as well. And uh, Dr. Mills, thanks for the nice introduction, but I'm far from what you described. I think the 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 real blessing is to be able to work with colleagues and scholars who are so much, um, how shall we say, um, just above and beyond what we can ever become, and they they push us forward and and move us in directions that we probably could never think of before. Professor Garfinkel is the premier Israeli archaeologist working in Israel today. He's um, older than I am. He's just a couple years away from retirement. Um, he's published over 35 books. He's, he's you know, had museum exhibits at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, at the, at the Louvre in Paris. Um, he's had fellowships at Cambridge and Yale and 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 Harvard and and various places, but uh, we've just been, been privileged to work together over the years. And yesterday, we just shared for a moment a little bit of of the intriguing uh, information that that we knew was going to break today, uh, as as the embargo on a press release uh, was was going to end uh, tonight or last night, I should say. So this has been very exciting for us to be involved with. And I'm just gonna give you a little bit of background before we get to the nitty gritty of what, what it was that that was announced today. And you guys can read the, the articles then a little bit later. Um, I've been working with Yossi and with the Hebrew University for many years now um, in a joint project um, that is equally financed and, and, and held between Southern and the Hebrew University. Uh, by law, when you work in these countries in the Middle East, you are normally partnered with a local university. The Hebrew University is the oldest university in Israel, and Professor Garfinkel has been the uh, director of the Institute of Archaeology there um, recently, uh, and so it's just been great to be able to work with him and with Israelis. We had actually on our team our teams over the years, you know, 18, 20 countries represented and had some of the largest projects um, in the Middle East uh, over the last many years together. So uh, this was no different. Our, our first, just to give you a little background, our first project together co-directing was at a small little site called Kirbet Kayafa, which was a very mundane kind of site that didn't have necessarily a whole lot of promise. But uh, in 2008, I was actually doing evangelistic meetings with Mark Finley down in Orlando. And in 2008, this inscription was announced that made headlines all over the world, including the New York Times. It was the oldest Hebrew inscription ever uncovered in history and written in, a, in the proto-Canaanite Hebrew script, an old, older version of the script. You can see on the top line, can you see my cursor? You can see the letter A or Aleph over here. And over here, you can see it written this. We found a second inscription in 2012 at the site. This one on a, on a, on a collar of a large storage jar in size, not written in ink this time. And uh, this had the name of Eshbaal or Ishbaal. 
And in the Bible, there is an Eshbaal or Ishbaal, sometimes called Ishbosheth, who was the son of Saul, one of the princes of Israel, and later became king after Saul's death at the hands of the Philistines and his own hand, and the death of Jonathan, his son, um, up in the Jezreel Valley. Uh, so this was, again, found in 2012. We published this uh, later, and again, uh, it made a lot of news. It wasn't Eshbaal, the son of Saul, that we found on the inscription. It was Eshbaal, the son of Beda. We have no idea who Beda was, but it's the same name from the same time period, and that is very, very significant. And again, another hint at this ancient script that we're going to talk about tonight. Um, this, of course, made headlines, and here is a image with my colleagues and co-directors, Yossi Garfinkel and Sarganor, with the Prime Minister of Israel, who was just, by the way, re-elected last week as Prime Minister of Israel again, kind of a major comeback for Benjamin Netanyahu. But uh, here he is reading this inscription. And why is this important? Because it is the Hebrew language that goes all the way back to the 10th century to about 1000 BC to the time of David. So we can trace the alphabet and Hebrew back to that point in time, which is very, very exciting indeed. Um, we were thinking as, as, as a team where to go next and excavate next. And uh, we, we started doing some work at, at neighboring Sucho, which is right across the valley of Elah, uh, where the famous battle between David and Goliath took place, and we thought that would be a great idea, but we were blocked in that by um, circumstances and other universities vying for that site, and so we we I prayed about it. Quite frankly, this is an answer to prayer, I believe, and we um, we looked at going to uh, another site. And Yossi and I, I still remember this meeting in Jerusalem. Yossi and I were looking at each other and said, "What what what site do you really think we should go to?" And we both almost simultaneously said Lachish. Uh, and that seemed far and beyond what we could do because it was originally excavated by another university. Uh, but uh, nobody had worked there for 20 years. And the, the site uh, license was given to our two universities to begin excavations there in 2013. This is the site of Lachish on the uh, right-hand side of the a screen here, you can see the rising mound of the site here. Um, that is the Tel, uh, an ancient Canaanite city that later was captured. Very, you remember the story of Joshua's battle with the Canaanite kings when the sun stood still? This is the famous battle that involved the king of Lachish as well. And so that's when Lachish is first mentioned in the Bible in the book of Joshua in relation to that event. Prior to that time, it was controlled by the Canaanites. And after that time, you know, uh, it 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 there it was destroyed. Evidently, there was a gap of two hundred years. It wasn't until the time of Solomon, Solomon's son Rehoboam, that the site was refortified, according to chronicles. And we have found evidence for that fortification. But that's a whole nother lecture, a whole nother discussion, a whole nother topic. So, an ancient Canaanite city was 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 here and. We were the fourth expedition to begin working at this site. The British started here in the 1930s. This is an overhead aerial view of the city looking down. That big white spot that you see right kind of to the left of the screen is the largest biblical period building of the Old Testament period ever found in any archaeological dig in Israel. It's the palace fort of the royal kings of Judah. And... Um, we have a lot of documentation for this city being the second most important city in Judah after Jerusalem when it when it grew in, in prominence after Rehoboam's uh, refortification of the site. So in 2014, we made a discovery, we found a, a temple, a, a late Bronze Age temple, a Canaanite temple um, from the Canaanite period. Uh, that uh, was was unexpected. We weren't expecting to find this temple. We were not looking for late Bronze Age temples. We were looking for uh, biblical period stuff that comes later than this time period. But we found this magnificent temple uh, with all kinds of goodies uh, and all kinds of amazing things in it. Um, you can see here the pillars in the front of the temple entering into the city. 
Um, there were uh, two towers or rooms on the outside there, partially preserved the interior of the temple here, which was filled with uh, destruction debris and all kinds of amazing material, burnt grain, as you can see in one of these pictures. Um, and so some of these things went in for radiocarbon dating. We were able to date the temple to about 1150 BC. Uh, so about 150 years before the time of David in the period of the judges. So very, very important and significant find. This was not an Israelite temple, but a Canaanite temple. There was still some occupation in Canaan during this time. And then the 200 year gap that we talked about until Rehoboam comes along. Um, yes, so, and in the process of that temple being, or just before we found the temple, we found this fragment of a jar uh, with just a few incised letters on it in the ancient Canaanite script, uh, the alphabetic script, the precursor to Hebrew and the alphabets that we still use today. And we published that in 2015 in our, uh, in our most prestigious uh, professional journal in our field. Um, and uh, that was actually uh, the first Canaanite inscription that had been found in the territory of Israel, modern Israel, in 30 years. So it just gives you an idea how rare these inscriptions are, particularly from the Canaanite period, particularly from what we refer to as the Late Bronze Age or even the Middle Bronze Age going further back in time. Now, Lachish actually, here's a list going back to the 1930s. Lachish has had more of these inscriptions, partial inscriptions, partial, just a few letters, maybe a word here and there, found at, at its site than any other site in the entire territory of what is Canaan today. Um, and that is very significant. We're going to talk about that in a few seconds. Uh, as we go down, but you can see starting in 1934, two inscriptions then, 1935, these are the excavations by the British, uh, by the um, by James Leslie Starkey, one of the first archaeologists working in the land of, of Israel or Palestine at that time, and then 1937, and then 1958, 78, uh, during the 78 is a question mark because we're not, there's been a discussion whether that's actually an inscription or a something else. Um, then 1984, um, and then 2014. 30 years later, we find this inscription that I just mentioned. And then we're going to talk about number 11 here uh, today. So that's the background to this. The background is there have been more inscriptions of the Canaanite language and the earliest form of the alphabet found at Lachish than any other site. And there's two reasons for this, we believe. One is that it's one of the most excavated sites in the country with four, now seven expeditions that have been working there. There have been three after ours. And secondly, because um, it was a very prominent Canaanite city. And we think perhaps even a kind of center for, for early writing and writing systems during this time. And and these inscriptions give us a, a, a continuity from the Canaanite uh, script and, and alphabet, which was the precursor, if you will, to the Hebrew script, and then the precursor after that to Phoenician, and then Greek, and then Latin, and eventually to the alphabets that we still, and the majority of people around the world still use today. So that's that's kind of where we're at here. Uh, the, the discovery was made in the area that Southern Adventist University excavated, Area AA. You can see it on the map up here. These are the squares that we excavated, and the yellow mark here marks the square that it was found in. On the first day of excavation in 2016, we were removing the geotextile that we put down between seasons to protect the unexcavated from the winter wash that comes down uh over the winter when we're not there and then we 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 remove all that dirt and that erosion and then we have the geotextile that we remove and on that very first day in that square um that discovery was made um and um we, we'll talk about that history a little bit here we are working in that field um this is our team um made up of primarily students from southern we had adventist students from Bolivia, from South Africa, from Helderberg College, 
um, and other universities join us as well. But uh, we had, I would say, 50 to 60 students and staff from Southern every year working at the site. We made up about 60 to 70 percent of the total team, together with Virginia Commonwealth University, Oakland University, um, Hebrew University, but Southern was, was the primary sponsor of the project together with the Hebrew University. And so really a cosmopolitan group of people working together. And here you can see part of that area. Here is uh, the person who found and the square or the area where the uh, find was made. This is Catherine Hessler. Some of you may know her. She grew up here in, in Collegedale, went to Collegedale Academy, went through the system here, came to uh, her, her first season in the field was, was between her, her senior year in high school from graduating from College Dale Academy and coming to Southern Adventist University. I immediately said, you're going to train to be a square supervisor that year. She was a bit overwhelmed with that, but every year since uh, she's been working in the field and she's been one of our best um, excavators. We have a whole team. We're a training university, so we're training uh, students to work. She's now a PhD student at Lipscomb University in Nashville and uh, as a co-publisher of the article, the scientific article that just came out um, uh, a week ago. So um, there she is. And this is the discovery. Um, <laughs> it's very tiny. I don't have a scale here, but you'll see a scale in a moment. It's only about two to three centimeters in size. So we're talking very, very small. It is a comb, a, a hair comb, <laughs> made out of a very rare material, elephant tusk ivory. Now we know that elephants did not roam the territory of ancient Israel. We don't have references to elephants in the Bible very much. We have bears and lions and we have other kinds of animals, but elephants we know are from Africa and the Egyptians brought ivory tusks up from Africa. The Assyrians, we know, received tribute from Africa and also received ivory from them. It was a luxury item back then, as it is today, which means this comb was uh, belonging to someone, not just anyone. Most of the combs we find are made out of wood if they survive or out of bone. This one is out of ivory. So it's kind of like finding a diamond encrusted comb, if you will. So that's one thing that made it kind of unique. When we found it in the field in 2016, it was encrusted in dirt. We didn't really recognize what it was immediately. We thought it was bone. It was completely, you know, encrusted in dirt. And we don't clean that in the field. We, we have special recording techniques. We put it in a bone bag. We mark where it came from, what locus it was found in, and all of that. And then we have a, a zooarchaeologist, a expert in bones, Dr. Ed Mahar, who uh, has been working with us all these years. He was in the field uh, that year, working back at camp uh, and the lab on, on, on the faunal remains of previous. And, and that day when we brought this back, he identified it as ivory right on the spot. So we knew it was ivory. We knew it was a comb, but the inscription that you kind of see there was not recognized. It's very lightly incised. It's very lightly written. And it was just simply not visible, even in post-processing, even under microscopes um, that were looking for all kinds of other evidence. Here you can see the inscription itself. I'll tell you about how that was found. Actually, it was found this year in 2022, in the first part of the year, while we were still under, well, not lockdown, but nobody was traveling in and out of Israel at that time. Uh, nobody could go into Israel for the last two years. Um, we were doing a, a ton of post-processing. We were paying doctoral students and we were working um, on putting artifacts together, vessels together that had been broken and smashed during major destructions. And we were doing tons of work, but I wasn't able to travel there. Nobody was able to travel here. And so it was all by communication through Zoom like we're doing tonight. And all this stuff was happening. So it was during uh, that time of you know, being separated, that Dr. Um, Madeline uh, Makuglu, uh, a, a biochemist, pharmacologist, uh, who some of you may know elderberry extract, uh, just as just an aside, if you go to any pharmacy in the United States and there's a company that makes elderberry extract as a 
immune booster. She is the person that founded that company. So she's also uh, a, a fairly successful person. Uh, and she has been part of our expedition now for quite some time. She was looking at the comb. She had been analyzing it. Her uh, One of her relatives was a very famous uh, scholar who focused on uh, head lice, actually. That was his area of expertise. And he actually looked for lice in the comb between the teeth. And so it had been microscopically uh, analyzed. Uh, we had immediately sent out samples for radiocarbon dating because ivory is, uh, is radiocarbon datable. Um, those came back inconclusive. There wasn't enough carbon left in the material for dating, unfortunately. But uh, as she was using her iPhone to take a picture of the comb at one stage, as it was sitting on her table in her dining room, and I just recently had dinner there with her on Shabbat dinner evening, she she was telling us the story. She she looked, uh, the, the, the light was from a certain angle, and all of a sudden she saw some of these, I'll go back a slide, she saw some of these incisions that you see in some of these markings on the comb, and she thought, oh my goodness, is this an inscription? And sure enough, this is the draw drawing by Daniel Daniel Weinstube, uh, a leading epigrapher in Israel. We sent the, 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 we had him come and look at the comb. We sent the material then to him and he began to decipher what it says. And you can see here the letters that are marked um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and above 10, 11, 12, upside down. Um, on the upside, it's a three line inscription. And, and uh, here is what this comb might have looked like. So while, while we were having these discussions, by the way, when Israel opened in March of, of this year, um, Giselle and I were almost on the first flight over there. We had all this backlog of work to do. We spent all of uh, spring break uh, working 15 hours a day on material and, and, and drawings and, and, and scientific publication. And we happened to go one day to the Israel Museum, to the Shrine of the Book, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. And here are these combs on display. I had seen them before, but had forgotten they were there. And now they had special significance. And you can see on the comb here that you have two sides to the comb, one where the, where the uh, teeth of the comb are extremely narrow and very close together, and another that is less so. We still have combs like that today. In fact, I can pick one up. I should have brought it over. It's sitting right over there. It's usually longer, but we have a side that has narrower teeth and a side that has larger teeth. Um, and these here are made out of uh, stone, uh, out of bone, I believe. They're not ivory, but you can see the teeth have been preserved. This is exactly the kind of comb that we found only much, much earlier. And in the between area between the teeth in that body of the comb is where the inscription was that we uh, discovered. And yes, under microscopic analysis, here is our comb. The teeth on our comb were all broken, but in the narrow area of the teeth, we even found the remnants of a louse, a single louse. The oldest louse probably ever found, <laughs> 3,700 years old, um, but there it is. So quite an amazing uh, discovery. And uh, it goes together very nicely with the inscription as well. So here's the comb. Here is the inscription. Here is the earliest sentence in the alphabet. The Canaanite alphabet was the first alphabet ever invented. This is the earliest sentence in the alphabet period. And it says, may this tusk or ivory root out the lice of the hair and beard. Now, I know what you're thinking, and usually people are laughing when I tell them what it says. It's a very mundane, kind of banal uh, inscription, but uh, it's kind of interesting as well, because it means, for one thing, that the people of this time period when this was inscribed, and by the way, these letters are very, very archaic. They take us back to the very beginnings of the alphabet. We are dating this comb based on the Epigraph based on the epigraphy, based on the shape of the letters, we're dating this comb. The carbon dates were inconclusive, but we're dating the comb to about 1700 BC. That is the time period of the patriarchs. That's the time period before Moses was ever around and, and so forth. So evidently, uh, people were writing, and in this case, writing something about it was a wish of some kind that was written on this comb for the 
person perhaps that received the comb, wishing for it to be a functional uh, tool to be used to get rid of lice in the hair and beard. And notice it wasn't necessarily a woman's comb because it refers to the beard. So perhaps a man uh, had this. We don't know who it was. We don't have a name. But here we have the first complete earliest sentence in the alphabet ever in history. So what conclusions can we draw from this? And I can send you the scientific publication and some, and I've got links to all the, uh, oh, it's been a whirlwind the last 48 hours. Um, the, the New York Times article was just released less than an hour ago, just before actually this call. Um, it's, I think, one of the better articles that was written. Um, it's in the Jerusalem Post. It's in the Times of Israel. It's in the BBC right now. It's in the CNN has it. Um, Associated Press, it will, now that the New York Times has it, more people will have it tomorrow. At any rate, um, the significance is this. First of all, there were more Canaanite inscriptions found at Lachish than anywhere else in Canaan ever. In fact, there's only one or two inscriptions found at other sites, period. So to have 12 of them found at Lachish just dwarfs in an enormous way any other site in the territory. This leads pot to the possibility that Lachish may have been the primary location where the alphabet was first used widely. So that's an interesting concept, or maybe it's simply a happenstance that we have found this many things there. Um, it's the first sentence ever written in the alphabet. Um, why is that important? Because uh, if I can say this without being over dramatic, in, in my, and I gave this tour last year as we had the Bible exhibit at our museum. And I would say this every single time because our whole exhibit was built on this premise. There were three major breakthroughs in the history of communication in human history over the last four millennia. The first was the invention of the alphabet. The first was the invention of the alphabet. Let me go forward. Before the alphabet was invented, this is what you had to deal with. You had to deal with thousands of Egyptian hieroglyphics by the Greco-Roman period, 10,000 glyphs used in all kinds of combinations, making it very difficult for people to really understand this language. And it was lost for thousands of years until it was... Um, it was recovered, if you will, and redeciphered by the French and English in 1822. But a very complex language. And, and there's still debates today how wide literacy was in ancient Egypt. I mean, to be a scribe in ancient Egypt was something that was revered. Not everybody could accomplish that, okay? So literacy was limited. Or you had this option, cuneiform. Um, again, a very complex system of writing that was around for a very long time, but was not alphabetic. And so when the alphabet was invented, it was an enormous breakthrough. Suddenly with 22 letters to 26 letters, depending on what alphabet today we have, 26, 28, whatever, we, we, we were able now to take a, a few little characters and mix them all up and make words for the first time. And this simplified writing forever. In fact, that's why it's still used today after this many years. The alphabetic writing is the same writing that we still use today. Later, this alphabet, point number four here, later this alphabet would develop into Hebrew, into Greek, into Latin, into the modern languages that we have today. But this inscription that we found, dating back to the earliest time of the alphabet, probably the oldest, is, is, is way before the time of the first biblical writers. If we date Moses and the Exodus around 1450 BC, we're talking about 250 years earlier uh, is the origin of the alphabet. So I believe there was no invention more significant in communication than the invention of the alphabet. What was the second breakthrough in communication? It was the invention of the printing press. Johannes Gutenberg in 1455 with the printing of the Bible. Yes, the Vulgate in Mainz, Germany was amazing, but what was he using? He was using a movable type printing press that was using the alphabet. And even today, the, the latest uh, a major breakthrough, of course, is the internet, in social media, where we can text and communicate instantaneously with each other all around the world. 
yes, that's amazing, but we're still using the alphabet. So really the Canaanite contribution to the world over the course of history was the alphabet. And of course that was handed down to all future generations. So it's quite incredible when we think about this uh, this uh, invention in light of what was used for hundreds and hundreds of years prior to this time. Um, and so we come to the conclusion. And I would just like to say it's it's humbling. I, I'll say this, the comb when it was discovered was just another object among the tens of thousands of objects that we found during the course of our excavations at Lachish. And, and it was only in the post-processing that the significance of that comb was uncovered. I was speaking with my colleague Yossi as I was taking him to the airport this morning. I'll see him again in Boston next week and we'll, we're gonna be presenting this uh, to our peers. But I was sharing with Yossi, uh, Yossi was sharing with me, he says, Michael, he says, we need to now investigate and, and look at every single other comb that is in every museum where uh, it, during the Canaanite period to see if they have inscriptions on them or other, I mean, we have to reanalyze things. Maybe somebody else missed this as well, but luckily we didn't. And we were able to find that five and a half years after it was excavated by Southern students at Southern, at, at our excavation there with the Hebrew University. So, you know, it's it's a team effort. This is our team in 2017, uh, the, the last year of our expedition. Um, it's a team effort. I just want to thank all the, the the volunteers from all of these various countries, the staff, the scientists that came together, that uh, have done all the various analyses on this on this one object, and and there's so many other things that we're analyzing as well. Um, Dr. Ed Mahar, our zooarchaeologist, is sitting right next to me. That's him right over here. Um, here's Madeline. She's the one that discovered the inscription this year in 2017. Here's Yossi Garfinkel, my colleague over here. I'm right there. And these are our staff uh, and, and volunteers in 2017. It really has been hundreds of people that made this possible, this one find possible. And, and you know, it's literally, no, it's even more difficult than finding a needle in a haystack. So really in the end, we're just very, very fortunate and we need to praise God for allowing something like this to be found and the significance of it, I think, is 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 very real. It's it's banal. It's a mundane sentence, but it means that people were communicating even those common things very early in history. Which means the Bible could have indeed been written just as we believe it has been, but uh, it gives us a very important indication in the development of the alphabet over the course of time. That's all I have for you this evening. Thank you very much. Can I ask a quick question? Would, of course. Would this have been found, Dr. Hazel, had there not been COVID forcing you to look so closely at other things and uh, doing digs? Just a question. You know, I, I don't know. I don't think so. I think um, we, we are processing all the material. Um, let, me just, um, let me just stop the share so I can see everybody here again. Okay, here we go. Um, I, I, no, I don't think so. I mean, I, I kind of try to look at the silver lining from COVID as well. Sometimes, um, we have been analyzing a lot of other materials as well. We've been reconstructing pottery. Um, you know, we have, we're going to have our first museum exhibit on Lachish, um, ever, uh, coming to Southern in, on January 29 this year, we're in the process of working with the Israeli government and bringing materials here and, so we've been working on multiple different levels on various objects and various things. Um, I think, I think it was partially Madeline's interest and her relative's interest in lice that kind of started the process of investigating. So we're we're publishing specialized articles already now, even as we're working on final publications. We're we're writing specialized articles now already on various finds. So. Uh, last year, an article came out um, in one of our pa major peer-reviewed journals on 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 bone fibula and 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 nice incised bone uh, fragments. So we're we're kind of taking various categories of finds and analyzing them. 
And so, you know, we, we, we published that. We've published the Late Bronze Age Temple several years ago um, in another journal. We've published, uh, we published various aspects of things. And so this was, I think, another stage in that process. So I don't really see it as such. Um, it was, you know, people are working and we're working constantly to now publish the material that we excavated over a five-year period in Israel. Thank Any you. other questions? Yes, I see. Uh, Doug has his hand, and also there's a link from Alistair. Uh, he's put a link to the New York Times article. Yes, uh, that's there it. In your chat. Great, uh, thank the you. Editor, the editor emailed me with the link literally just before uh, the call, and I was able to read it just before we got on. So well, it's, thank a, you it's, a, it's one of the better articles, I think. He really did a good job and interviewed a number of different people, so it was good. All right. Thank you for sharing. I appreciate that. I have a couple of really simple questions. One is you said that the comb is small, but it looks like it's kind of rounded on either end. Is this a fragment of a larger comb or was the comb itself intended to be very small? And then my uh, second think, question is, yeah. where is the comb now? <laughs> okay. So, so the first question, um, I think that this is probably the, it does, it is broken at one end uh, slightly. Um, and, uh, but I think this is pretty much the extent of the, of the comb. I don't think it went a lot wider than this, maybe on one side, a little bit wider, but I think it's pretty much the extent. I don't think we have just a fragment of it. We do have the complete inscription on it, which, which, uh, seems to indicate that it is, um, that the comb is intact as well in terms of its original size, except that the teeth are all broken off. The comb actually was found in a secondary context. Let me explain what that means. It was not found primarily where the person that used it last um, uh, 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 had it. In other words, it was not found in a context that dates back to the Middle Bronze Age or the 1700 BC. It was actually found in a pit that was dug just before Nebuchadnezzar's Babylonian destruction of Luck. Kish and Jerusalem when he destroyed the temple in 586 BC. So, so the find spot of the comb archaeologically doesn't help us very much. That's why we sent it for radiocarbon dating. That didn't help us very much. So what so in a sense, we're we're tied only to the nature of the script and and the nature of the letters which we know were not were standardized around 1100 BC so we know that the script was more standardized at that time and we know that before that time it was not as standardized and we kind of have a bit of a a process involved that we can compare other inscriptions to and there are some gaps in that so but this comb is we believe the earliest version of that alphabet just because of the other examples that we have now, the other examples only have a word or two or a few letters. Um, the jar fragment we published in 2015 from Lachish had some letters in the alphabet that had never been found that early before. So that was really cool. We had some new letters that we knew existed in the alphabet, but that we hadn't had examples of that early before. But now we have the first sentence ever, and that means that people were already writing this early in history. So that in itself is very, very significant. Where is the comb today? It's in Israel, of course. Um, all objects remain in Israel. Um, everything that we excavate belongs to the Israel Antiquities Authority and is, uh, well, they are, they are, a lot of the material has been, is in our lab where it's been processed. The comb um, was in a, uh, a safe at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem uh, before analysis. Uh, and um, and today, of course, it's back in Israel. Um, we are not planning to bring the comb to the United States for the exhibit in January. That's the next question probably somebody's going to ask. It doesn't fit with our topic, which is Sennacherib's Assyrian campaign against Judah, which was uh, a thousand years later. Uh, so um, and also it's made out of ivory. The last time an ivory object came to the United States from Israel it was confiscated by customs because you're not allowed to bring ivory into the country. Now, this is an interesting little funny story. I told it to my students yesterday. 
Uh, it was blocked in U.S. customs. The customs officials said to the government of Israel, we cannot have this come into the country unless you give us a hunting permit proving that this was hunted ivory or, and, and that this was permitted by the Israeli government. So uh, the ivory that was coming in actually was part of the famous Samaria ivories, part of the uh, inlays that were placed inside uh, or in furniture. We have ivory inlays in furniture that the prophets deride the, the kings because they were so luxurious with all this ivory. They, they basically complain that there's too much, uh, you know, extravagance, if you will, um, in the biblical record that is mentioned. And, and the ivory, of course, is from Samaria, where Ahab, the, the Israelite king, was reigning. And so the story is told, I, I hope this is true, it was told to me yesterday by my colleague Yossi, the story is told that, that uh, the Israeli government uh, put a permit together, um, giving Ahab the right to hunt this tusk and 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 the and sent it to the American government and they allowed the ivory to come in. So I don't know if that's true or not, but it's complicated to to ship ivory. It's very complicated to ship ivory and bring that into the country because of these. Uh, we don't want elephants to be poached in Africa right now, obviously, and trying to protect the endangered species. There's uh, several questions here in the uh, chat. Uh, one is uh, the uh, 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 the predating Phoenicia. I mean, I was taught growing up that Phoenicia was where they uh, invented the alphabet. That yes, exactly, wrong. exactly. This 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 find, as well as other finds, that's an old theory that now is outdated and needs to be revised based on new evidence. And and our our inscription this year is is one of those one of those very very strong pieces of evidence. And in fact, that's in the New York Times article uh, that you'll be reading as well. That Phoenicia is no longer the locale for the invention of the of the alphabet. Um, it, well, let let me go back a little bit. Who were the Phoenicians? That's where that's the the term Canaan is used by the Egyptians going back into the New Kingdom period. So we know that already mm -hmm. around 1500 BC, the Egyptians are referring to Canaan and the Canaanites. So we know that that term is being used. But uh, Canaan, in, in general, is often being associated with the territory of Phoenicia. Um, so there is that connection, but but we know it it, it must go even earlier than, than what we traditionally believed with, with Phoenicia. So... The Phoenicians we think of are are later in history um, and in, are involved with seafaring and, and so forth um, later in time. Thank you. There's another uh, question here. Um, this is from Pastor Jeremy. Uh, yes. Hi, Jeremy. If, if you found new letters that had never been seen before, how did you know they existed? And why did you know to look for them? Right. Good. Um so we have later we have later examples of the alphabet. We have um, we have a uh, I'm talking so we're talking about the development of the alphabet. Maybe I wasn't clear. We're talking about the development of the alphabet, and for the proto what sometimes is called proto Canaanite, we just call it Canaanite right now. But the proto Canaanite alphabet of which our inscription would technically belong to. We don't, well, I call it proto, it's Canaanite. We know Canaanites lived in these cities and it's Canaanite. And the fact that we now found it at Lachish, a Canaanite city, we know that this is a Canaanite uh, inscription. But but having said that, um, so we have a 10th century complete alphabet found at Tel Zayat by my colleague Ron Tappy from Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. That was found in 2005 and published, and that was a big, big discovery. It's just the alphabet written on a rock that was uh, uncovered in a wall dating to the 10th century uh, Judah, for, to, to the time period of Judah. So we have the alphabet in its complete form going back at least that far. But when I say that we have never found those letters before, up to that point in time for the Canaanite alphabet, the earlier version of the alphabet, we had not found those letters before. Does that make sense? So we kind of know, um, we know what the letters should be. We know what they looked like later. 
And we then extrapolate to what they might look like earlier. And so we, we kind of know what an Aleph should look like and what a, 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 a Tate should look like or a Tav as we call it today as well. We, we kind of know that, that the Tav is the cross, you know, we kind of know that. Yeah. Um, that's where our T comes from, by the way, still today, right? Um, so we know the shapes of the letters and, and lo and behold, on the ivory comb, what do we have? The Tav is a T, it's, it's, it's just a cross, right? Kind of sideways a little bit. Um, so yeah, the epigraphers that are working, and I'm not a I'm not an epigrapher. I teach Hebrew, but I'm not really a, an expert epigrapher. But the people that are working on this, and by the way, before we published this scientifically, we sent it to some of the other peer peers out there, some of the top epigraphers like Chris Rolston, who's quoted in the New York Times article and others. He wasn't a publisher of this inscription, but. He had nothing but positive things to say about our, our publication of it and, and our scientific work on it and so forth. So anyway, it, yeah, it's a process and we're kind of filling in the pieces of the development of the alphabet um, that we have. And this is a huge contribution because it's the first time we have a complete sentence. Before that, we just had letters and words here and there. So that's really Thank cool. you. Yeah. Um uh, let me guess that the wall that had the alphabet was an elementary school. Um, <laughs> Could be. Uh, there's another question. Uh, uh, what is the difference between Lachish and Ziglag that Dr. Garfinkel referred to on Monday night? Yes, thank you. Some of you were there at, at the lecture. I asked him, you know, to speak on Ziklag because that's an excavation he has directed. I haven't been involved with directly as a co-director. I, I stopped excavating in 2017 to work on Lakish publications. And, um, you know, if you keep digging and digging and digging, you don't have time to publish many times. And we have so much material to work on. So that's what I've been doing a lot uh, the last few years. And so uh, Professor uh, Garfinkel has been working until 2021 at uh, the site of Kirbet El Rai, which he has identified as biblical Ziklag, the city that David and his men lived in um, on the behest of Achish, the king of Gath, according to the Bible. Uh, at any rate, um, so that it's a very intriguing site because I told you that that the Canaanite city of Lachish ended around 1150 BC. That temple that we found was destroyed. The site was destroyed. We don't know by whom. Um, obviously, this is after the time of the ex of the Exodus and conquest. You know, if we date the conquest early, which I do in the 15th century, around 1400 BC, we're 250 years later. So Canaanites, even though the king of Canaan of Lachish I should say the Canaanite king of Lachish was conquered by the Israelites. It appears that Canaanites still continue to live at Lachish and they had Canaanite temples there. And it really, by the way, Lachish is not mentioned at all in the Bible from the conquest until Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. It's not mentioned. So there's a, there's a gap. This is a very prominent city, by the way. There's a gap in the biblical record about Lachish. And precisely where that gap is in the biblical record before the time of Rehoboam, we have Kirbet El Rai, three kilometers away, that has never been excavated, and that Professor Garfinkel and Sarganor, who I worked with at Kirbet Kayafa, went to excavate because it's it's not a tell that has cities after cities after cities on top of it. It's a Kirbe, it's a, it's a shallow deposition of maybe two or three periods that are there. And they went to excavate that site. And what they found was that that site is actually occupied for a period of 200 years, just before the time of Rehoboam, according to the biblical chronology. So it appears that the people after Lachish was destroyed, you know, you don't always rebuild a city immediately. Sometimes it's abandoned for a while. In our case, it was at Lachish. It appears from all the excavations that we've done. Um, and maybe they, we, we think maybe they, they moved to Kirbet El Rai, settled there for a while until Lachish was then later on rebuilt. And maybe they moved back or maybe they stayed over there. We, we don't know exactly. But then it becomes a major, major Judean city um, after the end of the 10th century when Rehoboam rebuilds the city, probably after Shishak's campaign, which is uh, described in the Bible. Let me just have one closing uh, uh, question, and sure. that is, 
there is so much doubt about the Bible by many archaeologists. Um, why do you, uh, why are you a biblical archaeologist? Can I share my screen again? Because the next slide answered that question. <laughs> Let me share my screen here again. Let me go back to that last slide that I had here because the next slide had that. I stopped with this slide. I wanted to give my colleagues credit, but our science faculty at Southern Adventist University in biology, chemistry, physics, um, and our religion faculty, we get together every month and we read through various books on science and faith. Sometimes they're on science, sometimes they're on faith, but the integration of both of those aspects. And it's always been a very good dialogue. We're currently reading through this book by Eric Metaxas, a very well-known author who's written a, a phenomenal biography of Martin Luther, another one by of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a Christian author. His book is entitled, Is Atheism Dead? And uh, the book is, is, is uh, the book that we're reading through right now. So last Friday, actually, I, I let out in the discussion uh, of this, they had read through, uh, the group had read through uh, the first, um, I don't know, uh, eight chapters or so. And, and what's interesting, this is, a, this is now an apologetic argument for theism, for the belief in God, generally. But what's interesting is that uh, the book is, um, is divided into three parts. The first deals with the hard sciences. Does science point to God? He's not a scientist, but he's writing and taking things from the scientific world. The second part um, is, is on archaeology. Uh, in the Bible. And the third part is on philosophy and epistemology. What is truth? And I asked the group that was there on, on Friday, I said, why do you think that this very well-known Christian writer, who's not an archaeologist, who's not a scientist, but is very well known for his, his articulate writing and his writing style, why would he spend this uh, a third of this book uh, on 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 atheism and on a defense of theism, why would, he, why would he spend a third of that book on archaeology? And I just threw that out and kind of asked, got different answers. Some people said, well, because archaeology it makes people excited about things, and, and, and he wanted to appeal to a popular audience. It is, it is a popular book. Um, you know, that was kind of the theme of the main argument that, was, that, that came out. And I said, well, I think there's another reason I think it's because that the Bible is first and foremost, not first and foremost, but primarily it is it is constituted in history. It is a book that has God intervening in human history in every step of the way, from the very first verse of Genesis, where God says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Moses is writing that to the very last book of Revelation, last chapter of Revelation where Jesus says, uh, write these things down for they are faithful and true, he says in verse in, in chapter 22 of Revelation. So, so the whole premise of the Bible is based on that. Is it faithful and is it true? Is, is it something that, 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 is, uh, that happened? Did these stories happen in history? Did these cities, did these did these kingdoms, did, did the events the Bible describes actually happen? And, and the, the Bible and, and the Christian faith and the Jewish faith, I, I believe, rise, rises or falls based on that. Um, Paul in 1 Corinthians said it very clearly. If, why is it that some of you do not believe in the resurrection of the dead? If, if, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not raised. And if Christ is not raised then your faith is in vain and your preaching also is in vain and you're still dead in your sins. So Paul recognizes that the, the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, the historical event of that happening, Jesus intervening, God intervening in human history by sending his son, Jesus Christ, is intrinsic and core to the entire framework of Christianity. And it is what separates Christianity and Judaism and monotheism, if you will, from all the other religions in the world. If I can be as bold as to say, the Bible is unique 
because it is based on history. None of the other religious texts from the major religions can claim that. And because it is based on 30% prophecy, those two elements are unique when it comes to the Bible. And so if you can remove history from the Bible or the historical veracity of, the, of history in the Bible, you destroy the Bible. And if you, if you remove prophecy from the Bible, you destroy the, the ability for the God of heaven not only to interact in human history, but to know the future of human history. And those two elements are, are, are very, very closely linked together. And for me, Seventh-day Adventism incorporates both. We look back to the to creation, to the seventh day Sabbath that was that was inaugurated at the beginning of, of creation, all the way down to the very end of human history, uh, to the advent of Jesus Christ. And those are events that happened in human history and everything in between. So yes, that's why we have an Institute of Archaeology at Southern Adventist University. That's why archaeology started, the discipline started, because people were interested in exploring the ancient Near East and looking for evidences for biblical cities. Um, we wouldn't have the discipline of archaeology otherwise. Um, and, and that is why you won't find an institute of Buddhist archaeology or Hindu archaeology or, or even Islamic archaeology anywhere in the world. Um, yes, on Islamic history, but not on the archaeology of, of the religion as such. So this is something that makes the Bible very unique. And, and that's why we are engaged in biblical archaeology.